it's lovely to see so many of you here today to join us for this panel discussion on digital development strategy, service delivery and information security. Um, I begin this session just by acknowledging the traditional custodians on, of the lands where we're meeting, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and I pay my respects to their elders, uh, past and present, and I extend that respect to any First Nations or Indigenous people um, joining us here today. Uh, my name is Heather. I'm uh, one of the program leads at the Asia-Pacific Development Diplomacy and Defence Dialogue, um, also known as AP4D, um, and I'm delighted to be chairing this panel uh, today. We're going to be hearing from three fabulous speakers, followed by an opportunity for you all to ask questions um, and engage in a bit of a discussion with our wonderful speakers. Um, to kick us off, we'll be firstly hearing from David Roach, the director and co-founder of Catalpa International. Um, and David will be speaking to the critical role human-centered development and digital, sorry, design and digital technology can play in improving service delivery. Um, he'll, kind of, he'll be unpacking why effective program design starts with the needs, behaviours and motivations of people, as well as examining the relevance of the human-centred design model in complex settings and systems, um, which will be very interesting, I'm sure. And, and then building on that, we will be um, hearing a presentation from Caitlin and Dinny, who I believe is joining us online. Um, if she's there. We can't see her, but she is there. Um, so welcome to Dinny as well. Um, and find, they will be, uh, Caitlin and Dinny, oh, here she is, hello. Um, Caitlin and Dinny will be speaking um, on a mixed method study to understand help-seeking behaviours and experiences of survivors of gender-based violence, drawing on some of their recent work. Um, our final speaker today is Anastasia, who is one of my colleagues from AP4D. Um, and Anastasia will be speaking about the challenges to the development sector posed by disinformation and misinformation. Um, so as you can see, we've got a, a broad range of really interesting topics to cover. Um, and I'm also looking forward to hearing your questions later in the session. Um, but without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker, David. Um, so David has over 20 years experience in the field of international development, design and technology. As the director and co-founder of Catalpa, he has been instrumental in the development and implementation of a diverse portfolio of programs that harness the power of design and technology to drive lasting change and improve the lives of people across the Asia Pacific. Over to you, David. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. So, um, yeah, so uh, I've been in the field of international development for, for quite some time. And I think it's really important to sort of understand the approach and where I come from. As much as I work in the digital space, a lot of my background's in um, international development theory and practice, and also in the application of design thinking and human-centered design models and trying to solve complex problems. So. Today, I'm just going to talk about the critical role of human-centered design and its combination with digital technology uh, in improving service delivery. So the first one, I'm going to start with why um, effective program design starts with the fundamental understanding of the needs, behaviors, and barriers of people. Uh, I think we heard today from the Deputy Prime Minister of um, Fiji about the importance of empathy and taking human-centered approaches. I'm going to talk about the relevance of human-centered design in problem solving in complex environments. We often think of it as being a little bit more fluffy and solving consumer based or the acceptance of certain products and services in the commercial space. I'm talking about its relevance in, in more complex settings. And then as the development practice, as we start wrangling with the emergence of digital technology, um, there's a real need for us as development practitioners to better harness the capabilities of digital in the sense that amplifies positive impact, how we enhancing the the impact of our work using technology. And I have 15 minutes, so I'll try and rattle on pretty quickly. Um, and I'll be simplifying a lot of complex um, topics. So just bear with me and you can ask me hard questions uh, during the, the break. So, you know, why is this relevant? And this is one of the fundamental principles is that digital is no longer an emerging trend for development practitioners. It is now an effective part of development practice. So, uh, in a recent forum in Timor, we, uh, with all DFAT funded programs, we asked which, which of your programs incorporates digital? Everybody put up their hands, health, education, governance, social accountability, social protection, they all use digital. 
in a meeting with the uh, Minister of Health in Papua New Guinea, he said his two core priorities were skills and digitization, seeing those as core factors of driving improvements in health service delivery. So increasingly, it's becoming a blended part of effective development practice. And there's a few things for us to know, and why is this changing? And one is the limits of digital technology are no longer the greatest barrier to the adoption and utilization of digital services. There are so many creative and effective ways to ensure digital products and services that enhance government service delivery are put in the hands of people, working offline, being human-centered, all of those types of things are all available to us now. And what's happening now as people are interacting with more services, they're on Facebook, people's expectations are shifting and they're demanding more of governments in their own services. So think, needing to think about having online strategies or engaging in different ways. And so I think my core message today is that the technology part of digital programs is not as important as all the other factors around it. Humans and their behaviors, the structural barriers to technology, the political economy, buy-in, is it creating value for humans? Those are the most important aspects of digital design. And our sector, we constantly focus about digital as an output. We're making an app, we're building an MIS. And that type of approach doesn't lead to effective development practice. And the other one is, yeah, so there's a lot of room for us to improve. So I'm gonna do a really quick crash course in some fundamental design approaches. So human-centered design is a design methodology which is focused on creating empathy in the design process. So it is, it starts with understanding the needs, behaviors and motivations of individuals. And so oftentimes when we talk to people about human-centered design methodologies, we'll explain that it places an importance on the individual on people. And people will say, yeah, I do that. I'm really passionate about people. That's great, but we're talking about the application of a design methodology, which encourages the participations of individuals in that design practice and an understanding of their needs and behaviors. And that takes the primary focus of a human centered design model. That's where you start. And it's called the desirability. Do people want the things that we're making? Do they like them? Will they use them? The next one is the application of our understanding of the individual in, in other methodologies. So service design and systems thinking. Taking an understanding of the individual, how do they um, move along a service if, if it's a social protection program what's the registration process like how, what are they thinking and feeling what are their barriers for adoption and how do we get them through that service and systems thinking that broader understanding of how that individual and a whole range of other individuals with needs and motivations fit within complex systems and one of my one of the most important is co-design and uh, I'll talk about that uh, in more detail, but I, I really want to make sure that we're shifting away from buzzwords. Co-design means building things with the people that it benefits, not consultation. And that's an important shift for us um, as a sector. So starting with people. So as I said, the, the methodology of human-centered design, there's a number of different approaches that it uses. So obviously user interviews, um, uh, in-depth studies, uh, spending time in the context where people are uh, living and working, development of personas, so we have a good understanding of that individual, doing empathy mapping, what they're thinking, what they're feeling, what are their barriers, what parts of this program will they like, what won't they like? And so it really at its heart is about creating empathy. And so through that process, trying to create as much empathy in that design process as possible. As I said before, desirability place is a really important element for the, um, the buy-in or the use of services that we're making. And in human-centered design, it tries to create a balance between desirability. Uh, am I uh, creating something that has utility for an individual? Will they use it? Will it provide benefit to them? Along with feasibility and viability, is it cost-effective? Can this actually be achieved in this context? But desirability is the first order of preference. Am I making something that people want and need? The next one is this battle between ease and motivation. Um, so within the technology space, and you'll you'll hear uh, through the next speaker's talk, is this real this uh, merging of behavioral design approaches. And one of the most influential figures in that is someone called BJ Fogg. And uh, BJ Fogg's main um, premise is that motivation is really difficult to change. But if we make things easier for people to do, that behavior is more likely to happen. We just need to nudge it. So that idea of removing barriers, making sure that desirable behaviors are easy, 
that's what technology does. That's when you get your notification for LinkedIn, it's nudged you, it's made it easy to get in there. And then 10 minutes later, you're wondering why you're in LinkedIn. Uh, and the next one, these um, human-centered processes, it's all about uh, managing risk. Often programs are designed centrally, uh, that wheel is placed down at the, at the frontline level without an understanding of the acceptability of those services. And in if anyone was in Prima Clark's talk yesterday about education services, you can see the lack of understanding of how teachers will use education resources, what the facilities are like. So grounding that in human realities uh, helps manage risk. And so I'm going to take a sip of water. Mm. So I want to move from principle into practice. So um, this is a program that we implemented with uh, in, in Papua New Guinea with the National Department of Health and the two primary hospitals. And so when we start empathizing with health workers, we, we all know certain things. They're time poor. They have uh, poor access to culturally and contextually relevant learning materials. They are on, under a high cognitive load. They have a lot to do and limited resources. And then we know that traditional training models, they often pull out health prov providers from hospitals, services stop, and we try to jam as much information in their heads in a week. And then we expect them to take their printouts of PDFs and go back and apply that knowledge. And so when we start empathizing with the realities of health workers, how do we design programs using technology that are more contextually appropriate to them, things that they will choose? And so one of the things that we did in the um, Kumbul Health School program is we shortened the learning experience. We knew if it was easier to do and it was easier to complete, it's more likely to happen. So that ease principle, using micro learning over a mobile device, getting courses down to 10 or 20 minutes, making sure it's culturally relevant, contextually relevant and appropriate. So it's acceptable for, for people and having uh, health practitioners engaged in the learning process. We did mobile learning. It's the device that people have. When you know about individuals, people have a mobile phone in their pocket. How do you leverage that device? How do you create learning that's personal for them? And then we focus on reducing barriers and creating utility needs. And there's some results there from a Lancet study. So improvements in, in knowledge, improvements in confidence, and 100% agree that the learning uh, methods were appropriate to them. And then we see people learning on their own time learning when they can. In education programs we've played the site that applied the same model where people are learning on the bus to school, prepping for the lessons and learning subject matter knowledge. So it's about appropriateness. And when you place the, the context, the needs and behaviors of individuals and design services around them, you create more effective services. People are more likely to use them. And as I go through this, have a think about some of our your approaches or other approaches that you've seen in applying digital. Oftentimes we apply MOOCs, massive online courses, which are hours long or two hours long, would videotape this session and put it online for people to use. But we know that um, people like my, uh, Sister Daisy is time poor. And so we can perpetuate using digital poor practice. And so we need to understand that it's not benign. The next one is how do you take, so integrating individual needs into system-wide services. So, one of the lines that I was like is you never interact with systems, you only interact with the individuals. Individuals have needs, they have motivations, they have barriers, but they work in systems. And so in the process that we do, we try to make sure that we are um, focusing on empathy and alignment within each level of the service. In a mobile health program in uh, East Timor, we focused on what are the needs and barriers for mothers in demanding health services. How do we make a service that is valuable for them, that they want and that they will ask for when they go to the clinic? And then for the midwife, what is a service that is valuable to the midwife? How do we make her job easier? How do we provide value for her? And then we go, what's the next level? It's your facility manager. What does the facility manager want to know? Wants to know about the birthing load, wants to know about the, the amount of ambulance calls they've got. How do we make that person's role uh, better? And we keep moving up, but focus on creating services that create value at each level within the system. And, you know, one of the most important things about digital is this ability for mutual problem solving. And so if I can solve a problem for a midwife and she is, in, uh, she is registering mothers into a service because it helps her do her job, I'm automatically collecting data and information on the demands with that service. It's uh, the, the, um, the amount of uh, mothers that are expected to deliver in that catchment and what the percentages are. And you can feed that up the chain for um, decision-making. And when we think about lots of services that we design, 
we never focus on utility down the bottom. We're always we're always meeting central agency needs. So like I want to know the demands for a birth at a health facility. Let's do a survey and give it to a really busy midwife to fill out each week. When it's providing no value for her in any meaningful way. And when you're not providing value, you are no longer a carrot, you're a stick. And compliance is hard in, in these uh, in complex settings or with this limited oversight. And so moving from incentive for, to an incentive model over a coercion model is really important. Human-centered design is focused on people choosing the things we make, not being made to use them. And it's a really important distinction. And it and it separates the whole design philosophy from being more of an enterprise driven by functional requirement to one that is a human requirement. Am, am I creating value? And so what we want to do is try and create value at, at every level for those individuals where we can and shift to more bottom-up uh, utility-based models. So um, one of the case studies here, uh, and there's a few folks in the room uh, who've been instrumental in this program, so uh, appreciate it, is uh, a program that we're working on in, with, in Papua New Guinea with uh, DFAT and the Department of Implementation and Rural Development. And so I, I wanna try and take those principles of human-centered design and move it more into a complex system. And so there's probably nothing more complex than, than this one, which is trying to uh, look at addressing subnational um, governance issues and, and central agency coordination issues, uh, looking at the service improvement program in Papua New Guinea. If anyone works in Papua New Guinea, they'll know how, how the size of that challenge. It's around $650 million worth of annual fi uh, financing. And um, there's very little um, accountability and transparency of those funds. So over the last decade, it's still very difficult to determine how they've been used. And so um, the program's looking at trying to address that issue na nationally, working with the department who has a mandate for monitoring and compliance. Now, so what, what do we do if we're taking a human-centered approach? We start at the bottom. Although DIRD is the central agency, if we have a compliance mindset, where we are forcing that central wheel down and looking at data reporting, we'll, have, we'll be generating very little utility and value at the subnational level. So we start from the bottom up. So we start from how are we solving problems at the subnational level? How can we create a service that creates value for them at the subnational level that they'll use, that'll make their job easier and that provides value for them in their own decision-making? Because we know that if we do that, they're more likely to use it, and that will generate information to be used at the central agency level. By solving the subnational level issue, you can solve the central agency issue. And then uh, the next one, shifting from enforcement to engagement. So showcasing the practical benefits of a service. And then all of those other principles that, that determine effectiveness and, and, and utility, ease, removing barriers, reducing friction, all of those are still really fundamental in services. And so and by, by having a really practical utility-based mode of working, you can get around the difficulties of that political environment by working in a very practical way. And there's profound impacts with these models. We're not only changing the relationship of information from the, the central agency to the, the subnational level, but you're changing the nature of coordination amongst a whole range of actors. They're changing management practices at the subnational level and generating uh, uh, additional benefits. And so uh, this program is in the, in the middle of its uh, national rollout. And we, uh, over the last six months, we've seen around 500 uh, different uh, users come onto the platform. We're seeing districts paying their own way to come to training to learn how to utilize this system and a really broad range of interagency cooperation from the Department of Finance, DMPM, DICT, if anyone knows all these acronyms from PG, if you don't, you can Google them and from the prime minister's uh, department as well. And there's a set that they're, they're moving to this because it solves their problems and it provides utility for them. If we went there saying, we want you to solve DIRD's problem, do we think anyone would pay to come to a training event? The answer is no. And, and so, and, and you're seeing an increasing mode of trying to shift that mode uh, of thinking. And so I'm just touching on these really lightly. How am I going for time? Oh. And so this is the next element that's really important is around co-design as a practice. So what this means is that as we work in programs, it is not the implementing partner's responsibility. It's definitely not my responsibility to do the problem solving. 
I, I don't own the problems. I don't have skin in the game on the resolution of those problems. We are facilitators of design. And so this is the importance of the co-design co process. And in a recent um, forum, a disability advocate got up and said, consultation is not co-design. I'm sick of people talking to me and then going off and writing and designing their own program. We're talking about mutual problem solving. And so in design thinking and human-centered design modes, the, the role of a designer turns into a design facilitator. How are we supporting those who are immersed in that problem to come up with the answers to those problems themselves? That's really important. So we're not just being influenced by the experiences of people, but the programs are being shaped by them. And so we do lots of things, encouraging design feedback, rapid prototyping, getting people engaged in the making of services, role-playing in social protection programs. We'll get people to role-play what that interaction is so to determine its suitability. And, you know, one of the most important elements of co-design process, other than just designing programs that resonate with the people that you're working with, is this element of buy-in. And, and buy-in is such an important determinant of program success and so the, there's one nice study that I, I, I love, which was called the, um, the IKEA effect. And so it got people to build IKEA furniture and it got them uh, to sell the piece of IKEA furniture that they had made themselves and a piece that had been previously assembled. And people negotiated higher prices for the piece of furniture they assembled themselves. So what is the fundamental principle there? Is people value the things that they make. And so the more that we can encourage co-design, co-creation into processes, the more programs, the more people buy in, the more they're representative of their ideas, and, and, and the more that we get system, uh, systems, processes, and, and, and services that are reflective of that intelligence. And so, so th this is the fundamental question. So how, how do we fundamentally continually evaluate our programs by the value that they create for individuals. So this is a really important one. Um, focus on outcomes, not outputs. I, I, I probably talk very little about technology in this session, and that's important because technology is not the largest determinant of success. It needs to be good, don't get me wrong, this, but the design approaches are far more important in, in, in getting, them, getting them right. The other one is bridging design and um, development practices. So when you see human-centered design and, and digital technology as a tool for problem solving, you, in, you integrate them into your program design, into your program logic. When you see it as an output, you put out tenders for MISs. And so how do we integrate uh, those capabilities? And this is what is happening more and more in our sector. How do we integrate those capabilities within our design processes and our problem solving processes? Because like the experience in the hospitals in Papua New Guinea, we can reinforce poor practice using digital technology. We can still pull um, midwives and health workers out of hospitals. We can still do really poor learning programs that aren't contextually relevant or culturally relevant using digital. It will amplify good intent or bad intent. So that's really important. And, and one of the things that I, I, I see all the time, we sort of jettison our development practice when it comes to digital. You know, our port, the importance of bottom-up development practice, that's a fundamental development principle for us. And so that's something that we need to maintain as we're designing programs, is ensuring that we are creating value right down the bottom, because that's how you build value up the chain. You have very little um, effectiveness and sustainability if you're going the other way. Um, the other one is embrace iterative design. Uh, we do lots of things where we uh, try to get the product and service out, even when it's not finished, trying to get people interacting with that so we're learning. And um, and there's a whole methodology for that called a minimum viable product approach, if anyone's interested, look at that. The other one is on uh, utilize ease and utility. So remembering that the more barriers that we remove for a service, the, the, the least amount of friction that we create, the more likely people are to use that. And so in, in, in contexts like Papua New Guinea and East Timor, programs can get derailed if the printer doesn't have toner. And so how do we design programs that don't need that component? How do we design a component that, that oh, if I lose my phone, I just get another one? You know, we, we need to think about the resilience of those programs in this context and the fragility of them. And, and the last question is just, I, I think um, I, I, it's been really interesting in the conference hearing 
um, people's struggles in the international development sector and, and talking about the ineffectiveness of it and us building two schools next to each other and, and uh, one is populated and one isn't. Um, you know, we see that all the time. And, and I think that, that the importance of empathy in design it is really fundamental and shifting the design away from this idea of that international expertise is critical for problem solving. It's not. We, 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 uh, that the role of a design facilitator is far more fundamentally important for the success of programs and supporting others to solve problems. And so, uh, yeah, that's it. So thanks so much. Thank you, David. Um, very interesting. Uh, it was what resonated with me was that creating empathy within um, design processes and methodologies, and and that the technology we can we use either um, amplifies good or bad intent. So they were two takeaways um, from your presentation for me. We're now going to hear from our next set of speakers um, who are going to speak about how one in three women in Indonesia have experienced violence in their lives. And although there are a range of services offered by government, which are often free or su subsidised, survivors of gender-based violence either don't know they exist or choose not to access them. So U UNDP, in collaboration with the Behavioural Insights team, carried out a mixed method study to understand help-seeking behaviour and experiences of survivors of GBV. Um, to talk more about that, it is my great pleasure to introduce Caitlin here. Um, Caitlin is a senior advisor with the Behavioural Insights team. Uh, she has more than 10 years of professional experience working across multiple countries within Asia um, and the Pacific. Her work focuses on applying behavioural science to diverse policy challenges, from gender equality, such as women's access to justice services, to sustainability, such as um, household waste management. She has a background in economics and psychology. And she's joined online by Dini. Um, Dini is a practitioner in the development and humanitarian sectors with over 10 years professional experience throughout Asia, Pacific and in the Middle East. Uh, Ms. Santi, has, uh, she was the technical officer for peace and justice at UNDP Indonesia. Um, and in that capacity, she helped strengthen the judicial uh, integrity in the country by leveraging new technologies, while also fostering gender and disability inclusion to the Supreme Court's whistleblowing mechanism. Um, welcome to the stage, Caitlin. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, thank you so much for that uh, introduction, Heather. Uh, firstly, I, I want to apologize for my raspy voice. I was um, at an event on the weekend cheering very loudly and it's left me with this delightful sounding voice, which I was hoping would be gone by today. Um, but uh, feel free to ask me about that at lunch. Um, so Dinny and myself will be um, doing a bit more of a deep dive into a particular project uh, that we worked on together in Indonesia. Uh, so this was a, a collaboration between UNDP country office in Indonesia and the behavioural insights team. Uh, so myself in Australia and my colleagues in Indonesia, as well as in Singapore. Um, I think David's um, presentation was a fantastic introduction, um, um, talking about uh, human centred design and, um, and its importance in thinking about um, digital uh, solutions. So um, the project that Dini and myself will be talking about, um, we applied uh, a behavioural insights approach to this particular project. Um, behavioural insights uh, is, has some very close ties to human centred design. Uh, for anyone who hasn't come across it before, uh, behavioural insights is an approach that uses um, evidence of the drivers of behaviour uh, to address practical issues. So um, I might just start quickly by talking through um, at a very, very high and quick level uh, the, the methodology and the framework that we use when applying a behavioural insights approach uh, to, to a project. Uh, and then I'll, I'll pass over to, to Dini. Um, so uh, in BIT, we apply um, what's called our tests methodology, and um, we've applied this um, all across the world um, in, in hundreds of different projects um, and in different um, policy contexts. Essentially, the idea is that we start by targeting what we're looking at, um, and ideally, we identify a particular behaviour that we're trying to change. 
We then move into um, an exploratory phase, which uh, for me is the most important phase um, of our projects. And this is very much where we try and understand the particular context of the behaviour that we're trying to change uh, and very much to understand the behavioural barriers and drivers um, in that particular context. We then move into a solution phase. So this is where we are designing solutions and interventions um, and, of course, an extremely important element of co-design in this phase as well. Then we move into a trial phase where we implement and evaluate our solution or our intervention um, before moving into the scale phase where we um, look at our lessons learned and look at what can be um, applied and scaled up elsewhere. So I might um, at this point hand over to Dinny. Dinny is going to talk through um, the particular exploratory phase that we went through for this project, um, which was quite in depth. Uh, and then um, I will then talk us through a particular digital solution uh, that we used in this project um, and some of the results from our evaluation of that. Uh, so Dinny, I might pass to you and please let me know when to go to the next slide. Thank you, Kathleen. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can. All right, it's good to be here. Good day. Let me preface my presentation by saying how honored I am to sh uh, share the insights of eight inspirational survivors through our people center research as a stepping stone to deliver survivor center justice service in Indonesia and beyond. Next, please, Kate. Thank you. All right, just a brief snapshot of why we commenced this research. In 2018, UNDP Indonesia facilitated knowledge sharing to improve surface provision for GBV survivors, which resulted in the establishment of one-stop center in Jakarta, modeled after the Sunflower Center from South Korea. Now, despite being awarded as 45 best innovations in public service and proactive social media campaign, Unfortunately, the center received a relatively uh, low number of visitors. Now, of course, this is very consistent uh, with the national trend that one in three women experience GBV and they are largely unreported. So in order to uncover the barriers and enablers to help seeking, we chose a heterogeneous approach to research by mixing immersion and behavioral insight as a contextually grounded ethnographic research. Now, this hybrid method helped us to gather uh, people-centered data by understanding how survivors navigate the justice ecosystems, their justice needs from their lens and their perspective. So we all know more than 5 uh, billion people lack access to justice and um, many of whom do not resort to formal justice systems, hence, this people center research is conducted to help address justice needs and to transform justice systems and meet people where they are. Next, please. All right, as you could see here that our research cycle is quite extensive. We co-design our study with the IT, providing technical briefing to our research team so that they truly know how to apply immersion method and also to uphold the um, do no harm principles at all stages. We then conducted our uh, field work with um, eight female study participants with various educational backgrounds, socioeconomic status and ethnicity, all of whom unfortunately experience more than one type of GBV. After thick data is collected, we then uh, delivered uh, the briefing to ensure we capture the complexity of realities and systems and how the prevailing norms influence the status quo. Then we finally, uh, together with the IT, uh, conducted sense making and co create the foundational architecture of our uh, research with um, the IT. Next, please, Kate, thank you. All right, uh, I think we can uh, go to next. Now, understanding factors that influence behavior are the key to behavior change. Now, the COMBI model recognizes that behavior is influenced by many factors and therefore behavior changes are triggered by modifying one of the uh, or at least one of these components. So capability refers to psychological and physical ability. Opportunity refers to 
uh, external factors that make a behavior possible. Lastly, motivation refers to the um, conscious and unconscious um, cognitive processes that motivate behavior. So this model is effective because it identifies not only the barriers, but also enablers for behavior change for a successful intervention. Next, please. We are all aware that GBV is a complex issue and hence we need to understand better the nexus between systems, power and gender. So as you can see from the diagram, all components of barriers and facilitators to help seeking behavior are not mutually exclusive. They are highly interconnected. So we found that dominant barriers include the low awareness of what constitutes GBV and how to get help, sociocultural norms that discourage uh, help seeking due to stigma surrounding GBV and beliefs about the um, consequences of help seeking. So one of the most striking findings from our immersion research is that prevailing social and cultural norms on marriage and divorce affect the kinds of role models, help seeking crumbs and opportunities in the apartment uh, that survivors uh, have. Role models in turn influences survivors identity as well as their awareness of what constitutes GBV. Now in the following slides, I will explain more on each barrier and how it connects to each other. Next, please. Is that the slide you're after, Dini, or did you want the next slide? Yeah, next, please. Thank you. All right. So our immersion research helped us understand the complex justice ecosystem in Indonesia and how norms and role models influence survivors' awareness, which in turn impacts their belief about their help-seeking uh, abilities. This explains survivors' low awareness of what constitutes GBV due to, uh, again, harmful sociocultural norms that perceives GBV as taboo, a shameful matter that needs to be dealt privately. Some survivors, unfortunately, normalize this GBV because of role models, such as their mothers who accept GBV as part of marriage. Now, this has been exacerbated by survivors' low awareness of available GBV-related services which affect their belief in their um, ability to handle the situation. Next, please, Kate. Oh dear, okay, we can see again here that the prevailing norms um, can also determine uh, survivors' opportunities to seek help. Um, I think that's motivation, right? I think uh, the Previous one, Kate, sorry. All right, okay. So yeah, as I said, we can see here that the prevailing norms can also determine survivors' opportunities to seek help. So we learned uh, from our research that harmful norms on marriage and divorce resulted in the lack of prompts and opportunities to discuss GBV or reach out to other people for help. All of which, uh, if you will, is a disparate manifestation of power imbalances that reinforce the status quo of inequitable systems. Okay, next, please. All right. Now, how does this vicious cycle of inequity affect uh, survivors' motivation to help seeking? All survivors in our research had low motivation to seek help because they believed that this will have negative consequences for them, such as uh, the stigma surrounding divorce and hence they remain silent. Some of them um, who attempt to seek help do not know how to access support services and don't have resources such as time and money, which negatively influence their beliefs on their ability to handle GBC. In the next slide, we will learn more on the survivor's journey to help seeking, so please be prepared. Next, please. All right, can I skip this? Next, please. All right. Okay, I'd like you to immerse with me in this heartbreaking yet true realities of the survivor's 
So it identified the leverage points that could be strengthened in improving the pathway of help seeking behavior. So from all study participants that we immersed with, we could see from the yellow diagram that they largely stuck on the circle of silence, unless one survivor who seek for help to formal channel as she literally almost died from the injury, but still refused to proceed to formal court because she didn't want to bring shame to her family. So eight out of nine tried to seek help through their inner circle, such as mothers and sisters, but they often didn't know how to respond effectively or worse, actively discourage speaking out due to harmful norms that normalizes GBV. That is normal for women to experience domestic violence because that's your contribution as a wife and a mother. Some even view it as a martyrdom for uh, divine reward. Now, where does this lead us? We identify leverage points to improve service provision as depicted in the diagram, including um, empowering inner circle to help connect to formal and informal support services through digital technology. Nonetheless, the different realities from the survivors raise a legitimate question. How do we improve help-seeking behavior if the ecosystem doesn't support and structural barriers persist? I'll stop here and hand it over to Kathleen to explain more on some interesting findings from the trial at Kathleen. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dini. Um, so uh, as Dini mentioned, and as I think we all know, uh, gender-based violence is a, is a very complex issue that will require a multi-pronged and multi-year approach. Um, this particular project that we collaborated on together, um, a, a large chunk of, of our time was spent on this really in-depth, immersive research. Uh, so unfortunately, we found ourselves with not a, a lot of time left in our project. Um, but I think one of the um, the advantages of digital solutions is that they can be uh, very quick. Uh, so for, for the remainder of our work together, we then um, decided to um, trial one particular uh, digital intervention um, and, and, and evaluate its um, effect on behaviour. Um, but of course, we, we absolutely recognise this is just, you know, one, one small drop in the ocean. So together, we um, co-designed a social media campaign in the form of Instagram ads. Um, and these ads encouraged the inner circle of um, gender-based violence survivors to contact an information provider to refer them to relevant services that were available for um, gender-based violence survivors. And these were a range of services um, from things like crisis-orientated services such as shelter uh, to things like psychological counselling. So um, the theory of change for this particular intervention and the, the idea behind um, this intervention was that um, an individual, um, ideally uh, uh, someone from the inner circle of a gender-based violence survivor, would um, open social media, as I'm sure all of us do on an almost daily basis. Um, they would view the advertisement um, that would encourage them to take action. They would decide to get more information by um, sending a, a message to the WhatsApp hotline. So essentially on Instagram, there was a, a, a button they could send to send a message, which would take them to a new WhatsApp conversation uh, where they could um, select which services they were um, interested in finding more information about. Uh, and that WhatsApp hotline was manned by um, a member of the UNDP team. Then through the WhatsApp referral system, um, they would obtain that information about the different services. And the idea was that they would then follow up on that information, um, either by directly contacting the service provider or passing that information on um, to, their, to their close contacts. So um, we were very keen to, to run a trial of these different ads to see their effect and their um, um, you know, which of these may be uh, more or less impactful. Um, so we ran a, um, an RCT, a randomized control trial um, on Instagram just for a week and a half. So our ads were targeting females, either currently living or recently living in Jakarta, 21 to 55 years of age. Uh, we had the um, ads in um, Bahasa yeah. um, and the education level was either at university or, or up to doctorate degree. Yeah. So we then had our participants randomly allocated to see one of four different ads. Um, and we used different behavioral insights principles to design different versions of these ads, um, which I'll, I'll show shortly. 
Um, and then essentially we used um, a lot of the uh, metrics and statistics that we got from Meta and Instagram uh, to look at the relative sort of Im impact and reach of these um, different ads. So the four different ads um, each contained two images. The second image was the same across all. So it was essentially encouraging people to click the, the um, send message um, button so that they could start a, a conversation in WhatsApp. Um, and each um, first image encouraged people to swipe to, to know how to help um, and get more information. So our control ad essentially said, one in three women in Indonesia have experienced domestic violence, take action. Our injunctive norms, so um, anyone who's not familiar with injunctive norms is highlighting things that we think people should do. What's the sort of right thing to do? So here we said domestic violence is a public matter. Together we have the responsibility to take action. We had a role model version of the ad. So this was framed quite differently to the others. And this was um, using words of one of the participants of our um, immersive research. So I was brought to Tarakan Hospital by my sibling. That made me believe that I have a future after this trauma. Um, and then in brackets, uh, DV survivor, 49 years old. Save the future of someone you care about. Um, and then lastly, we had our urgency message. So if nothing is done, um, and I can't see because of my own image. <laughs> if nothing is done, domestic violence can be life-threatening. Don't wait until it's too late. Thank you for your help. I can't remember them all off the top of my head. Uh, so these were the four messages. Um, so essentially we ran our, um, our ad campaign for a week and a half. We were very fortunate. We had a million viewers over that time. So we had about um, 250,000 people viewing um, each version of um, this ad. So again, uh, uh, you know, we were really happy with that reach that we were able to have. Um, of course, you know, Jakarta being a capital city, a lot of people have mobile phones and access to internet. Um, but, you know, this was a great use um, of the, you know, very little time that we had left on this project. I'm going to um, very quickly talk through some of the high level findings um, from our Instagram trial. Um, I am very conscious of time, so I'll try and be quite quick, but we do have um, a blog posts on our website, both in English and Bahasa, that talk through the, um, the details um, of our findings uh, a bit more in depth if you're uh, interested in finding out more. So essentially we found that our role model version of the ad um, was um, meant that users were most likely to click that send message button um, to uh, get more information from the, the WhatsApp um, helpline. Interestingly, or maybe uh, not so surprisingly, we did find that that um, click rate of that send message button was the same um, across the four ads after viewing the second image, which was the same across um, all of, of the four different versions of the ad. So not very surprisingly, but we did have very low engagement with that second image. So it did seem to highlight that, you know, that first image that appears on Instagram, people are much more likely to view and they're very um, um, unlikely to scroll to the next image. Um, out of the million viewers that we had, uh, only 26 actually engaged in a two-way conversation in WhatsApp. So once I'd actually hit that initial send message button and some information was sent to them, did they sort of respond back? So only 26 out of a million. So not a huge number. Um, and we didn't see any um, sort of statistically um, different um, different uh, impacts across the four different types um, with, with obviously such low numbers. A few other interesting things that we found. Um, so actually the, the injunctive norm, so this is the, um, you know, talking about uh, what's right, what people should be doing, that it's a, a public matter, um, actually resulted in the most likes. Um, so obviously, you know, on Instagram, you can hit the like button. Um, and then similarly, the, the urgency message um, resulted in the most shares. Um, so, you know, sharing to, to, to their friends on, on Instagram. So essentially we found the injunctive norm and the urgency ads were the most effective at encouraging that sort of um, user ad interaction. So either people liking or, uh, or sharing the ads, uh, whereas the role model was more effective at actually encouraging people to, to seek out more information. There were three main themes that emerged from the live chats. So um, as I mentioned, we only had 26, um, but the, the three consistent themes that came up were around the scope of um, GBV related services. So, you know, what types of things does it cover? 
um, a lot of the practical aspects of the services. So things like, you know, how much does it cost? Um, where is it located and how convenient is it? Um, and then lastly, also just general questions about what is gender-based violence, um, how to address it, what to do if they see it um, come up, particularly on social media. Um, so, as I said, very, very quickly, just touching on some of the, the key findings from our trial. Again, I'll just quickly touch on some of the sort of key lessons that we think are, are, are helpful and, and applicable beyond our trial. Dini, I might actually pass to you just for this slide if you want to talk through these three points here. All right, thank you. Now, as we approach the last slides, um, let's take a moment to ponder, have we truly employed contextual development approach based on the needs and wants of the people that we serve? How do we transform systems rather than reinforcing them? How do we harness digital technology to improve access to justice for survivors? Now, learning humbly from the insights of survivors, we know that business as usual is not working. Then can we do it better? UNDP has formulated the power dispersal uh, Dandelion approach, an inquisitive and explorative development approach that deepened our understanding and sensitivity to power and gender dynamics in systems transformation work from the survivor's lens and experience, not coming from what we think we know. Now, this hybrid research is our stepping stone in dispersing seeds of power. So we learned that role models or inner circle play an effective role uh, to help seeking behavior. And so empowering them to deliver restorative justice is critical to complement the uh, formal justice systems. We also appreciate the need to improve justice services on the ground, not with idealist visions of um, what justice should look like um, according to donor plans, but to be more survivor-centered, more grounded, and more accessible. Now, from this research, we've also recognized the power of uh, digital technology as feasible um, leverage points to help seeking behavior, to increase access to different justice providers, to improve reporting mechanisms that provide safe spaces for whistleblowers and survivors. Last but not the least, um, there's an urgent need to promote data empowerment as opposed to data extraction by generating more people-centered data to understand how justice is um, experienced locally by survivors and identify what works, where, and why, and to help ensure that justice service investments are informed by local knowledge and the views that are um, directly affected. I will stop now. Thank you very much. Back to you, Kate. Thank you so much, Jenny. I will leave the last slide as we are out of time. But as I said, if you're keen to know more, um, I can pass on the links to our blog post. Thank you. Thank you, Caitlin and Dinny, and, and apologies for cutting you off a bit there. I just want to ensure that we allow time to hear from Anastasia as well as open up for some questions um, from the audience towards the end. Um, so thank you for that fascinating presentation. We have a bit of a shift now with our final presentation. So we've heard about some of the ways that technology can be um, a tool for, for great development outcomes and, and to change behaviour and all those sorts of things. But there is also a kind of a dark side to it as well, I suppose, if you like. And um, cyber, attacks, cyber attacks, cyber crime, disinformation and misinformation represent a growing challenge to society and the development sector is not immune. Um, for example, every development project now takes place in a highly polluted information um, environment, both globally and in country. Um, and as the impact of theft and ransomware of data, malware and other forms of information space di disruption are becoming more pervasive, carrying big potential risks for development outcomes. Um, Anastasia is going to be presenting the findings of work she has been doing and exploring some of the risks fa faced by development organisations in the information space. Um, Anastasia is currently an advisor at AP4D and she's leading this project on, on information space. Uh, she has previously been the National Security Editor at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, advisor to the National Security College Future Hubs, an Intelligence Manager at Department of Defence, as well as the Editor-in-Chief at The Diplomat magazine. Her research interests include disinformation, climate and security, and the geopolitics of technology. Over to you, Anastasia.
Thanks very much, Hannah. Um, because of time, I'm going to cut right, right to the chase. So we're going to be talking about um, mostly about disinformation. If people want to talk talk about cyber, please uh, come and see me after this presentation, or um, uh, you know, in, in your questions, uh, ask me about cyber. We're going to stick with disinformation just in the interest of time. Um, here are some uh, definitions, and I'm going to skip through them, but these are the terms to know. Propaganda is different, again, from um, mis, mal, and disinformation. This is the EU definition. It's probably the best working dish definition around. EU has the most um, sophisticated legislative framework uh, around the information space, so they're a good place to look. So misinformation, false information is shared, no harm is meant, malinformation, Information is true, but it's shared for malign purposes. Think doxing, uh, think exposing uh, the addresses of the school where your kids uh, go, et cetera. And disinformation, verifiably false. Conspiracist uh, uh, content um, that is intended to cause public harm. Also, there's a huge economic com component. One thing I want you to take away from today is that disinformation and propaganda is really big business. People are making millions from it. Um, and there's also like huge implications around health and environment. Here's just some, some of the stuff that, uh, you know, that some of the tools that disinformation networks use to do their business. Um, of course, memes, symbols, spectacle, data mining, bots and spams, di uh, diplomacy and public relations, like conventional channels, advertising, uh, yeah, info, entertainment news. Um, what I wanted to emphasise here is that disinformation is about bypassing higher cognition. Disinformation is going straight to the amygdala, grabbing you there. Uh, and making you stop thinking, okay? So it uses symbol, spectacle, horror, all the things that, hi that hijack your ability to reason is a very important. Um, I'm gonna, again, really skip through this stuff. The point of these slides about the neuropsychology of disinformation is who is vulnerable? And the answer is every single one of us, every single one of us, disinformation researchers included, and there's a whole bunch of cognitive reasons the way that humans are wired, which, again, uh, please ask me some questions about this. We don't have time to go through it um, so much here. Even if we don't believe disinformation, even if we're the, one of the majority, and actually the majority, uh, that don't tune into disinformation uh, and wh whose brains have not been hijacked uh, per se, for the rest of us, disinformation creates confusion, kind of despair, passivity. If we actually believe that 30% of our compatriots believe in uh, that climate events are caused by Jewish space lasers, for example, it's quite disheartening. You know, it kind of makes you think, how can how can we live together? How can our society function? You know, it leads to you know those kinds of extremely negative emotions. Uh, and feelings of isolation, um, you know, that we can't relate to our fellow citizens, that we can't organise, that we're part of a minority, that the forces of disinformation um, are just too powerful. Um, okay, a, a few key trends. These are global trends. And we step back and look at the entire globe. Uh, what are the trend lines here? Well, first of all, that disinformation is global. There is almost no part of the world, including Antarctica, that disinformation networks have not reached. Okay, So it's in all of your operating environments, and especially in the global south and the developing world, it is getting worse, and it's also getting worse in major Western countries too. The political risk that this creates um, is, again, rising pretty steadily. Next year is going to be a bit of a watershed moment. There are extremely important elections all around the world, which means that a lot of disinformation networks are going to be really pumping it out next year. And just, uh, you know, in, in our region, Indonesia, obviously in February, the US election um, in November next year. Um, so it's it's already been highly successful in destabilising the global security order, and it and it hasn't stopped. Um, the other thing uh, to think about when you're looking at disinformation in your operating environments is it's almost always connected to somewhere 
um, an information warfare campaign. Okay, so connected to North America, connected to China, connected uh, to Russia, connected to Iran, uh, connected to Indonesia is another. So there's always, always somewhere in this disinformation network a state, a malign state actor who's helping the disinformation along. Um, why, do they, why do they do this? Again, there's, uh, if we're looking at Russia and China, if we're looking at disinformation networks in North America, very different political systems, but what these actors all share is a very authoritarian worldview. Okay, so disinformation networks are always connected to a political project, and that political project is authoritarian. Okay, it absolutely is. Even when people are doing it for profit, like the Alex Joneses of the world or you know, the, the legion of internet influencers in Southeast Asia. Who benefits? Authoritarian actors benefit. So, um, and I'll just say, well, look, you know, we've we've known about disinformation for like at least 2016 when Trump got elected and Brexit happened, and we've tried to do all this stuff to make it stop. Why is it getting worse? Okay, there are all, all sorts of reasons why, but there's a couple of things here. One is, uh, is that, you know, uh, disinformation is an integral part of the business models of the big social media platforms, okay? They really, they make their profit off this content. So if you're looking just uh, at, you know, the voice, and this is Australia, which is a country that has a close relationship with the Facebooks of the world, only 4% of disinformation got taken down, um, so this, you know, even us, so you can imagine a country like Tonga, a country like Solomon Islands, a country like Indonesia. Indonesia is also working with Facebook, by the way. But, you know, their, their uh, ability to leverage is even worse. Okay, so uh, that kind of uh, content moderation is not going to save the world. Absolutely not. So we need to find other strategies. Uh, and the other thing is, of course, that the politics of dis disinformation has now become mainstream. So major parties in, you know, mo most countries of the region, including our own country, have to some degree embraced the use of disinformation to gain power. So when you've done that, the last thing you want to see is decent disinformation, disinformation legislation, uh, actual good faith efforts to work with platforms, et cetera, et cetera. You don't want disinformation researchers to take hold in your universities. So special interests, again, are the, are the reason why a lot of our fixes haven't worked. Having said that, the EU has been working very hard to come up with the world's best legislative framework. Next year is going to be a watershed year where essentially the EU is saying to platforms like X, and Facebook, um, and sorry, Meta, um, if you do not comply with our disinformation laws, uh, we, we're going to give you three chances. But after that, we're going to go for 10% of your global revenue. Okay, this is huge. Mm -hmm. Remember these platforms think, oh, well, that, that really won't matter to Meta or matter to Twitter or X. Uh, but it absolutely does. These, these services aren't actually that profitable um, in some ways. So... Um, They'll be testing the waters next year in a big way. So that's something to watch. Okay, I'm going to just really skip through these. If you want a brief prehistory of, you know, disinformation and how it got here, come and see me. Um, but so, something that you might come across um, in your operating, operating environment, the development world, is people like this guy, um, Tal Hanan, Team George. He's an Israeli... Uh, ex uh, probably intelligence operative who set up his own shop and his his business is uh, election um, fixing essentially. So how does he do that? He uses hacking and leak operations, hacking into a politician's email and leaking it, uh, hacking into it, creating emails that are scandalous and leaking that. Uh, what else does he do? Um, honey traps, that kind of stuff smear operations, and he also does voter suppression. So many of you probably heard of Cambridge Analytica, uh, became famous around the Trump and Brexit um, elections. 
um, they they went away, they got exposed and, and stopped doing business, but many other imitators took their staff and are doing the same thing in terms of scraping data, individually targeting electors, voters, um, with information designed to either make them not vote or vote for the wrong person or not vote in their own interests. Okay, so these guys are sort of metastasizing in the global environment. Uh, and they love to work in the developing world because the developing world has weaker institutions um, around, uh, you know, uh, media, journalism, law enforcement, etc. Um, so yes, the, the developing world, the global south, is is um, really uh, the place where disinformation networks uh, are, are really moving into very very strongly. Um, there's lots of examples. I've got here Mali, Solomon Islands, South Africa, um, India. So one of the reasons is is that when we're looking at state-based disinformation, so disinformation coming out of Russia, China, North America, Iran, etc. Um, they see the global south uh, as a place for proxy warfare. Um, in terms of Russia's defense doctrine, information warfare is their go-to. And their worldview at the moment is that they're at war with the West uh, and that war can be won through destabilizing democracies from within via information warfare. And also that war can be won by um, essentially garnering the sympathies of the global South to their cause. Okay, so the other thing they're interested in, especially if you look at uh, Russia's involvement in Africa through the Wagner Group, which is now been disbanded because their leader got blown up by Putin, but now has, you know, it's been absorbed uh, into the GRU and other uh, Russian intelligence agencies and the Russian military. One of the things that they love to do in Africa is kind of go to a local elite, say, hey, we're going to provide you with security in return. Um, you don't have any money, no problem. You've got some sweet mining deals. That's the original deal. Then they start to go, okay, you completely dependent on us for security. So what we want is all of it. You know, we want all of your biggest mining concessions. And they're most interested in gold. So Mali is an example of that. Sudan is an example of that. Angola is an example of that. Uh, and because they basically want gold to build up their, their foreign currency reserves for a whole bunch of other different reasons. Um, so basically, one of the things that they want to do is go into Africa and strip it for parts. Number one, really want to do that. And the second thing, to discredit um, Western institutions in the developing world as well. And aid institutions are key there, really key. They want to attack uh, the soft power of aid, absolutely, definitely the credibility of aid programs. So if you're working in an aid program, you might have already been a target, but get ready for a lot more. Um, how are we going for time? Um, I can basically share these slides with everyone so you can have a good look at these. Oops. Um, in, in our region, here's just some examples of propaganda and disinformation sort of, uh, of a recent nature. The Hawaii wildfires earlier this year, China and Russia used AI-generated um, images to organise, uh, originate and amplify this narrative, um, Hawaii, not Ukraine. So that the basic message was... Um, two things. This is for an American audience. You should be worried about Hawaii. Uh, the Biden administration is giving all this stuff to Ukraine and forgetting about the homeland. And their second message was that it's not climate, it's energy-directed weapons. And this is the real, and this is why they used AI. Okay? And you think, who would believe that? A lot of people believe that. Um, China disinformation and propaganda networks, of course, are uh, becoming more and more influential in the Pacific. Uh, and how, again, how do they do that? Uh, old fashioned influence, ringing up newspaper editors and saying, hey, you know, um, publish our pre press release in Toto, uh, but also uh, giving money to struggling media organizations. And this is the other kicker every single media organization across the world, and of course, um, in, in the global south, is struggling. Okay, uh, media business models suck. They're not getting any better. So they are a target for financial influence, uh, and Russia uh, and China is very good at doing that. 
Um, the other thing to remember in the Pacific is that North American disinformation is really prevalent as well. So all the sort of uh, far-right disinformation networks love to come into places like the Pacific for fundraising purposes. Um, another one that was uh, evangelical networks there again allied to far-right uh, disinformation networks again love to come in there for protalizing and fundraising purposes. Uh, and then there's weird players like um, uh, uh, Robert Kennedy Jr., who's, uh, you know, running for president now, but also has been a, a pretty famous anti-vaxxer. So, he, you know, he pumped, his networks pumped a lot of disinformation uh, into the Pacific as well. Uh, someone said that, uh, um, and someone who's very experienced media player in the Pacific said this to um, had, uh, uh, us yesterday, the media environment in, in the region is absolutely desperate. Um, so it's code red on the info environment in the Pacific. Southeast Asia, of course, no slouch when it comes um, to disinformation. It's a huge industry, a huge industry, often financially motivated. Uh, you know, the region is full of Instagram click farms, and they don't just work for regional players, they work for global disinformation networks as well. So if you're a North American disinformationer, and you want to, uh, you've selected your target that you you want to um, use disinformation against. You can hire these these quick farms to do it for you. So it's it's really big business. Um, often companies will hire these influence networks uh, to to for product placement to spruik their stuff, but then they can be quickly repurposed for election. Um, this other trend in in Southeast Asia. Governments um, have embraced disinformation campaigns, as we mentioned before, to gain power. At the same time, they're also legislating, um, and they've got these great disinformation laws that are essentially about silencing any dissent and any opposition. Um, so that's also something to, to keep, be aware of. Um, disinformation has also become a real vehicle, especially in Indonesia, for anti-China stuff. Um, so again, like, Something to watch for, I think, in the next two years is a lot of uh, potentially a lot of uh, anti Chinese uh, diaspora um, violence. Um, Indonesia is again big player, embraced it as a foreign policy tool. Um, so, uh, what, what are their targets? West Papua, uh, and so they feed disinformation into West Papua, but also the into the whole of the Pacific to garner sympathy for their aims in West Papua. Um, and, and the top uh, topics of disinformation in Indonesia is essentially politics, health, religion, environment, it, kind of in that order. It's also been on the receiving end of Russian propaganda, huge amounts of Russian propaganda aimed um, at essentially converting it to its point of view on Ukraine. Why? Because, uh, you know, Indonesia is seen as one of the leaders of the non-aligned movement. So diplomatically, a very, very important target. Um, given the, you know, the, the mainstream or the mainstream political embrace of disinformation, uh, civil society approaches might be best here, and that's something we could discuss. Um, so here's, again, some very quick implications. I'll just, you know, mention three here. It's a permanent feature, as we've mentioned. Um, and personal security, this becomes a problem. Personal security is always an issue depending on where you are for an aid worker. Um, but now aid and development workers, I think, are going to be you know, are, are more often targeted. So appropriate security measures are, is going to be something to think about. Um, trying to build credibility for your program in a completely infested a disinformation environment is just you know, going to be um, really, really hard and increasingly harder. Uh, there's also insider threat. So this is where someone who's working for you has gone down that disinformation rabbit hole and will be actively looking to, to sabotage uh, your program. So, you know, look for that. Um, the sudden amplification of violence. So in terms of an operating environment, what we know about disinformation is it can make populations turn on a dime and become violent. Um, so it's really good at organising militias. This information is really good at organising a mob, a violent mob, a moment's notice. So it just, you know, part of that operating environment means there's much less certainty, much more unpredictability. Yes, you, yes, certainly. I will, I will wrap it up. I'll hit that slide. Whoops.
what can we do? What can we do? Okay, so the first thing, communication teams um, for aid and development really need a disinformation unit. Yeah, everyone's aware of disinformation, but not very many resources in aid organisations are going to actively combating it. And one thing to realise when you want to actively combat it, you have to have a permanent approach. You can't just do it around elections. You can't just do it around a program because disinformation is pre-position disinformation in the information environment, so you have to combat it way out. Um, let's work with our partners. You know, the, the US is very seized of this issue, as you can imagine, the Biden administration, they're putting a whole bunch of money into the Pacific on, on information and media. You know, let's let's encourage more of that. Um, we probably need to work with, with our partners to regulate platforms and we need to do this multi-jurisdictionally. So we need to work with the EU, the US. Uh, it's, they're the biggest information markets and what they do will set the tone for the rest of the world, including the developing world. Um, Australia should be presenting itself and putting credible news and information um, into the region. There's been many attempts to do this previously. We need to rethink them, but we need to do this as a matter of urgency. I'm going to leave it there. Uh, and again, apologies if I went over time, Heather. Yes. Um, thank you for that, Anastasia, such a fascinating topic. And, and I'm sure if anyone has additional questions or would like to talk more about that, please um, seek out Anastasia at lunch because she is very knowledgeable on this topic and, and always willing to have a chat. Um, I'm conscious I've only left about 10 or 15 minutes uh, for questions. And I hope you do have some, given that I've, I've cut, cut the speakers off short to allow for that. Um, we've got some roving mics. If you just can keep your question, like start by introducing yourself and then and direct your question to a particular panel member um, and just keep us quite a short question if that's okay. Um, we'll go to this gentleman at the front and then, then the man behind him in the black jacket. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm Didar. I'm uh, from Apta uh, It was really good discussion. Uh, my question, let me just give a little bit of background on what we have. We are living in the world of disinformation and then in the other side, it's also a lot of risk to sharing information, how people will misuse your information, right? So I would just, uh, my question is regarding this co-design and also uh, HCD, human-centered design. Uh, how, how trust building will work there? I mean, how we are going to build trust between the people or the primary beneficiary of all these digital systems that we are working around, considering that we are talking about technology language there, that is very hard to convince people. Just wanted to see how you will tackle that. Start with David and then go to Anastasia. Hello. Uh, yeah, and uh, an easy one to start with. Thank you very much. <laughs> Look, I, I think, as you've probably heard through the panel, the digital technology is not benign. It can cause harm. And, you know, especially when it's being applied into sensitive areas, like the referral pathway for gender-based violence, um, there is potential to cause harm for those in those programs. And, and we've worked on them before that, that um, the presence of that interaction on the mobile device can be a trigger for harm. And so understanding that the services that you create still need to fit within a broader framework and a do no harm framework in, in and that, that is really fundamental because um, you could trigger incidents of violence through the services that you create. And I think that's really important having those mindsets when you're going into it. The, the element of building trust is a hard one in a noisy space. And, and I and I think it, um, we predominantly work in spaces where we're looking at the government's relationships, the citizens and the government's relationship through services. And so um, it, it is, I guess, in us, one of the things that was striking uh, during the talk on misinformation is how we both apply the same tools, but for different purposes. And so even in that campaign, there's in the, positive sense there's a design philosophy called don't make me think which is about 
uh, appealing to people's um, non-thinking levels of their brain, so they just make actions for positive behaviors. And you can see in the misinformation space how that same instinct is used for more nefarious purposes. And so there, there is an element of responsibility in design. And, and, and my main message is it needs to sit within broader frameworks in which we use across all development practice because you can do damage. And so it's really important to take that into account. Um, yes, just briefly. Uh, I think we need to start at the broader structural level. So we need to talk to companies like Apple and Microsoft who run the operating systems because they need to put in better um, protections and better encryption into their systems. Um, and we need to, to help our partner countries really lobby for that. And we need to lobby for that at the UN level. So that's, that's a really important one. Um, Cyber literacy is also really important. Um, and again, we, we do do some, Australia does do some work on, on that in that regard. The problem is, is that, um, you know, each citizen is a vector for cyber, for cyber harm. So it's really difficult to, to erase your risk in that regard. It's, it just doesn't work. Um, so that's, you know, that's the other thing, definitely literacy, but we really need a structural fix. I think the gentleman in the black jacket. Yeah, I'm uh, Andrea Striagin from Monash University. And my question is for David. Yeah, thank you for your insightful presentation on human-centered design. And uh, I've seen the benefits of yeah, government digitalization from the example of my own country. I'm from Ukraine. And over the past few years, yeah, the government has done a lot to digitalize a lot of its government services. And that has proven to be very useful now during the wartime where it enabled the government to be more resilient to provide governmental services where it's not possible to do it in person. However, this was still a like, centrally led like national movement of uh, governmental digitalization. But a lot of what you talked about human uh, center design uh, yeah, requires uh, bottom up approaches and uh, bottom up uh, strategies to implement this approach. But so my question is, how can yeah human-centered design uh, be implemented in um, digitalization efforts that are often led by national governments and at a central level? Yeah, thanks. That's a good question. And I've been reading about those efforts in Ukraine as well. And there's a, there's a number of um, countries leading this, Estonia being one. Um, you know, look, um, I... I the, the importance is, is where the design intent starts from. So often those will emerge from central agencies. We need to improve education. We need to improve demand on health services um, that there's, or social protections to payment. So they'll, they'll emerge from those spaces, um, which is really important because the you need the design of those services to sit within a broader logic. And, and often those are central. Um, it is that process of the designing of that. How do you turn... Those, that central agency agenda into a service that is meaningful. And I, I always, I find that a really interesting space as a design practitioner, transitioning the intent of a policy into something that's meaningful for people. And the, the, the efforts that you're talking about, you know, universal access to education would be that principle and how it's applied, you would be wanting to try more bottom-up uh, approaches or engaging people in those processes. So um, it is... It is the, the mix of the intent coming centrally and, and the approach coming um, from the bottom. I hope that makes sense. Thank you. Um, the, the young woman here and then the gentleman up the back. Thank you. On? Okay. Hi, thank you. Um, my question is for Anastasia. My name is Tian Yin. Um, I'm a student from Myanmar. And uh, my first time coming across the term mis and disinformation was when we were going through Myanmar election back in 2020, which also happened to be, uh, I think, a month or two right after the U.S. election. And I, I do believe that there was a lot of influence of um, uh, vote recount and all of that after after the U.S. election, when after the Myanmar election went through it. I don't necessarily believe personally that the um, Myanmar military was successful in being able to influence the public with the mis or disinformation from their end. But there's also um, rumors or conspiracy that bigger powers such as China and Russia, who also happens to be um, working very closely with the Myanmar military, um, was um, 
yeah, helping with that mis and disinformation. And I, I, I guess I'd like your view in what you think the motivations for these bigger powers to be influencing relatively smaller countries like Myanmar, um, and perhaps maybe because you you skipped through a few of your presentations, so maybe you could touch on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Good question. Um, what's the motivation for Russia uh, and, and China wanting to intervene in places like Myanmar? So um, for China, it's definitely strategic and it's geostrategic. So um, China is very sensitive about uh, access to uh, uh, sea lanes, um, to trans sea transport lanes. They see it as Myanmar being a partner in that. Um, also, a lot of members of um, the Chinese military are involved in mining businesses um, in, in Myanmar, and they want to keep uh, that that flowing, that money, that sweet sweet money flowing. The other thing is, of course, uh, Myanmar. These these countries don't have a lot of really good friends, um, and it's part of trying to build an axis of authoritarianism, if you like. Um, what disinformation does and information warfare does, and it, the success so far of it, is it gives authoritarian regimes confidence to pursue their aims. So it, previously, before the disinformation era, uh, the West could bring, you know, relative amounts of pressure to bear on these regimes. Um, and, uh, the, you know, the, the West would, uh, and these regimes might feel, like, okay, we have to do some window dressing at least um, to pl placate um, these powers. And now they feel less inclined to do that. The other um, piece of the puzzle is that Russia and China are saying to places like, I mean, you, you, you don't need the West economically. We can replace that. That's completely untrue. Uh, if you look at both the Chinese and the Russian economies, the Russian economy is not particularly healthy. Um, the Chinese economy is certainly not what it was. Um, but uh, And also places in South, all these countries in Southeast Asia are huge export economies and they really need um, you know, buoyant Western markets. Uh, but nonetheless, this is the narrative, um, and the narrative is very powerful for uh, military hunters who want to believe it's a new world order uh, and their values are about to take over. Again, to back, I think, is next. I just have uh, two questions. Uh, one for Kate. I was just wondering, uh, what was the motivation behind the uh, limitation of the cohort of women to undergraduate degree or higher? I was just wondering what the, what uh, motivated you to uh, have uh, that cohort specifically targeted. And uh, one for Anastasia, you seem to have a good sense of uh, the disinformation campaigns and uh, their kind of distributors. And I was wondering if you have maybe uh, more specific ideas around uh, who uh, or where was uh, the driver for the anti-vax um, in PNG, that uh, massive disinformation campaign there, and also the anti-Chinese sentiment in the region. I, I was wondering what kind of actors are driving that. Is that the authoritarian actors you mentioned in North America, or is that coming from somewhere else? I think that'd be really good to know if you do have that information. Might actually, if Dinny's still on the line, I might actually defer the question to Dinny if you wanted to jump in on why we targeted that specific cohort. Dinny, are you still there? Yes, I am. So um, thank you, great question. Uh, so the design of the um, uh, BI advertisements uh, online were actually derived from our immersion uh, findings, which is um, that um, the inner circle of the survivors are, you know, ranging from the um, age that you mentioned, and they're also using Instagram. That's why we don't use uh, Facebook, because initially we designed it with Facebook. And, um, well... Unfortunately, as Clay says, I mean, like they're not really, um, we don't get when like in a lot of responses because again, um, there's a constraint between them, um, you know, um, interaction in the social media, you know, it, it requires much more, you know, process in trust building to really, really get their, you know, um, attention to uh, empower the survivors to help seeking. So I hope that answers your question. Kate, you can actually add that if you want. Thanks. 
Uh, thanks, Denny. I think in interest of time, I won't add too much more just to say, um, I think from the immersion research and the particular sort of framing of the ads, we were looking at like an educated cohort. Um, but, you know, um, I, I think we were quite surprised by the number of viewers that we had, but we certainly would have loved to have had longer um, and to be able to test with different cohorts as well. Over to you, Anastasia, for some final comments. Sure. Um, just looking at the PNG campaign, the three major players, uh, China, Russia, and North America, um, who are pumping anti-vax information, not just into PNG, but just uh, everywhere uh, in the region. Really, uh, there's a real target um, uh, for Indigenous communities in Australia as well. Uh, most of those um, disinformation networks were North American, interestingly with some domestic ones thrown in. Um, what, are the, what are the motivations? Well, I mean, again, this motivation is really to discredit, uh, you know, Western technology and science uh, and also, you know, uh, Western aid efforts. So, um, uh, you know, China had a huge interest in sort of, uh, you know, countering this sort of Wuhan narrative. So, um, so that was one thing. Um, also countering ideas that their vax wasn't as good as Pfizer vax. Um, Russia had the same <clears throat> same issue. Um, and it's basically, you know, in terms of information warfare, it's to reach out and say to the West, there is no uh, environment um, in the developing world that you can operate where we won't come at you in some way, shape or form. So from a military and an information warfare perspective, those are those are the things. But let's also not discount. Once you, you know, uh, have got someone to co go down one disinformation rabbit hole and anti-vax is a really easy one um, because it's a new disease. It's really frightening. We don't really actually really know uh, about this vaccination. We're in an information poor environment uh, and also big pharma, well, you know, Sometimes they're not shining nights in the developing world. So all of that is an easy entry. Once you're in that rabbit hole, you, you can then be exposed to all sorts of other disinformation as well. And you'll probably believe it or you're more likely to. So it's a gateway for further destabilization as well. Thank you. Um, and we are over time. Um, if anyone has additional questions or would like to chat further to any of our wonderful panelists, please um, catch them at lunch. But uh, let's put our hands together for the great speakers.